Uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 13 for, for, through 14, it says this. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Today, I want to talk about peace. But the question is, what does the Bible mean by peace? Jesus, Jesus said this. He said, peace I give you. And I, I give you peace, not as the world gives, but I give you my peace. What, when the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to men, what are they communicating? What did the angels mean by this? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about three angles of peace, but I want to land on the last one. In the first angle of peace, not only in our culture, but in the Bible, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down, is this, it is peace as the absence of conflict. Peace as the absence of conflict. Most of us, when we think of peace, we think world peace. We think peace uh, between nations or peace between people and peace between nations and peace between people is an absence of conflict. It's an absence of war. It is, uh, it is rest instead of unrest. Uh, it, it is friendship instead of being enemies. And so uh, one dimension of peace is this absence of conflict. The, the, the second angle of peace is the peace is the inner work by the Holy Spirit in your life in the midst of chaos. Now, I would say that 99% of the times that I preach on peace, I preach on this kind of peace. This is the idea that the Holy Spirit has come to give you a supernatural peace that supersedes your understanding. It is an inner peace. Now, if you think about this in the context of this, the, the biblical story, uh, Genesis chapter 1 says that, that the Spirit of God hovered over the water and, and, and God spoke into existence and began to order the chaos. And we see this when the, Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. That's why the Spirit of, of God is symbolized in a dove because of Genesis 1, 1. And, and what we see is the Holy Spirit ordering Chaos and the Holy Spirit orders the chaos in our own lives. And so we have this inner peace when we come to know Jesus. We have this tranquility in our hearts no matter what's going on around us. Because this is what I've learned. I've been alive for 40 years. Come on, somebody. Anybody over 40? All right. I joined the club. Uh, this is what I've learned is that I can't always control my circumstances but I can control my response to the circumstances that are in my life. And I can ask God to give me peace in the middle of the circumstances that I have. And that is mostly what I preach on when I talk about biblical peace, but I'm not going to preach on that this morning. I'm going to preach on the third angle of peace, and it's peace as the status of an individual. It's the peace that we don't often talk about in church, but I'm going to bring this out uh, for you and unpack, unpack this for you this morning. It, it, and I, I must warn you, I, I don't know if I need to warn you, but today is more like a teaching than a preaching. And what I mean by that is that we're going to dig a little deeper into the scriptures, give you a little more theology and foundation, less practical application, because I think that what I have to share today and the message today is for every single person, but I think it will help, uh, it'll help strengthen your foundation. And so today is more of a teaching. Are we go with that? Are we awake in the room? All right. Just because I say teaching doesn't mean I'm going to be boring. All right, it just means it's going to go a little deeper. And so three angles of peace that we understand about peace. The first one is this, is that we understand peace is the absence of conflict. This is the majority of what we understand as peace, both in our culture, but also in the Bible, that peace is the absence of conflict. And so for us to have world peace, 
is for every nation to be at rest with one another and not at war with one another. And so we have peace. Peace is the absence of of conflict. It is the absence of chaos. Uh, It is where everything in in, in the world is kind of humming along as it should be. Uh, And this is what we understand as peace. The second angle of peace, uh, of what we understand it to be, is peace as an inner work by the Holy Spirit in the midst of chaos. Now, 99% of the time that I preach about peace, I preach about this kind of peace. This idea in Scripture is that when Jesus came and he left this earth, he gave us his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works within us to calm the chaos in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds and in our lives, and, and, and that peace is there for us to experience. Now, this is the, the, the kind of peace we receive when we're going through difficult things. And, and, and this is what we understand. I've been a Christian for a long time. Uh, and, and this is what we understand is that having the peace that, that, that is promised in the Bible does not mean the circumstances in our lives all of a sudden change, but it means that we can have peace in the midst of chaos, in the midst of disorder, because it is an inner peace that Jesus gives us. Are, are you with me? That is what we also know as peace. But the third type of peace and the third angle is what I want to talk about today is the peace as a status of an individual believer. The peace as a status of an individual believer. And so I want to open up with Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and I'll get it up on the screen. It says this, therefore, whatever you see a therefore, you've got to understand what it's Therefore, since we have been justified, Paul spent all this time talking about justification. Since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I I want to point out a, a, a very simple word that's easy for us to miss when we're cruising through Scripture, reading it, and it is the word with. All right, so it's peace with God. Say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three, peace with God. A a, a small preposition, right, that that is, if it's changed, it means something completely different. And, And here's where I'm going, that there is a difference between the peace of God and having peace with God. There is a difference in the Bible than having the peace of God than having the peace with God. And so I want to talk about peace with God. But first of all, let me open up with a verse about the peace of God. Philippians 4, 7. I love this verse. Philippians is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I love this verse because I pray this verse over people almost every time I pray when someone comes with me for a prayer request. And I ask for this kind of peace when I pray to God when something's going on in my life. And it says this, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace, not with God, but the peace of God. It transcends your human thinking. It is a supernatural peace that supersedes your own cognitive ability to calm yourself down. This is the kind of peace that God promises us. This is the peace of God. God. Let me talk about this uh, in a more practical way. I told you that over Thanksgiving, my family, all six of us, we drove to Sedona, Arizona to visit my mother-in-law. And uh, how many of you have ever been to Sedona, Arizona? If I were to sum up Sedona, Arizona, I would say spiritual, not religious, all right? That there's a lot of spirituality there. And throughout Sedona, there are what these things called vortexes uh, that you can visit. And they're different sites and different rocks and different formations. There's like five or six throughout the, the city and in the outskirts of the city. And, and what they say is that at a vortex, um, that there is this uh, energy that comes from the earth that if you go and meditate and, and, and be there, that you will experience peace and kind of this energy of the, the earth. And so, um, and so there, you know, there's these people experiencing vortexes throughout the city. And so we go on a hike. My mother-in-law decides to take us on a hike. And we pass one of the places 
of the vortex. And, and I see us coming up on the vortex. My kids have no idea what it is. And it's all these people uh, meditating, sitting with their legs crossed and, and their arms out. And some guys, like there's a guy, this bubbling brook going through it. And some guys like playing this long, like, flute or didgeridoo I don't know what it's called you know what I'm talking about this kind of big thing and here they're all quiet and here comes a Hanson family all six of them and and if there's anything uh that that sums us up we are a party just waiting to happen like my family we are either 60 miles an hour full throttle or we're sleeping like there is no kind of in between like no one has ever said man your kids are really calm right that is that is just not and in fact I heard I heard a speaker and if you have kids like mine I love all my kids but they're rambunctious and they're full of life They, they said this this just gave me hope what you love in a leader you don't like in a child because what we see in leaders, right, we want compliant children to be good and, and to do everything we say. But when you look at leaders, they don't really do everything that you want them to do. And so that gave me hope. And so I'm praying that all this energy is my kids turning into leaders. And so here we come by and, you know, screaming and yelling and having fun and pushing and playing. And we totally disrupt their peace, Right. I think they even guys guys stops on the didgeridoo and he kind of looks over and like, we're here, right? And I was able to take them out of this meditative peace by the chaos that was around them. It's interesting because people in our culture really want to seek a kind of inner tranquility and peace, but they believe it comes through a, a meditative process in their own minds, in their own ability. But what Jesus says is that I'm going to give you the peace of God that transcends anything that you're able to do. It's why people who, who are really, really smart, smarter than all of us, they still struggle uh, and have anxiety and have fear and, and, and they can't calm themselves down to an inner peace because it has nothing to do with your ability mentally to do it. That is the peace of God. That's a sermon in and of itself. But I wanna talk about the peace with God. You see, if, if we understand this, I think we understand a dimension of God's love for us uh, that, that is incredible to our foundation. In fact, in my observation is, is this, that, that, that many Christians uh, are not living to the full measure of what God designed them and wired them to live. That, that, that both their spiritual foundation and their spiritual formation is less than God's desire. Now, your spiritual foundation is your understanding of God and scriptures, and your spiritual formation is your experience of God in scriptures. And when I look around and I talk to people who say I'm a Christian, that I understand and I look at their life and I realize that they're not living to the full measure that God wants for them, that their experience and understanding is less than, and I wonder if maybe this peace with God has something to do with that. You see, if, if we truly understand our foundation and we have the experiences that the Bible wants to experience, you see, we, we, we dumb down the Bible to our own human experience, don't we? we? We want the Bible to match us. And if we're not living to the Bible, we'll say, well, the Bible must be wrong or maybe it's inaccurate or maybe that's for other people. But no, 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 the Bible wants our lives to be, God wants our lives to be conformed to the scripture. And so I believe that when you understand the spiritual foundation and formation at a level that God wants you to understand, it's gonna increase your intimacy with God and your joy that's been suppressed for long is going to begin to come out. So let me start here. I've noticed a trend in, in uh, American Christian culture in the last 20 years. Now I've been in ministry for 16 years and I went to Bible college for four years before that. And so I've just been able to observe over the, my, the last two decades of my life of being in ministry. And this is what I've observed. I've observed that, 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 that Christians in, in our culture have functionally written out a very important, it's not fun to talk about, but it's very important aspect of our doctrine in our, uh, in our faith, in our theology. And it is the doctrine of original sin. And uh, I say it's been functionally written out 
because it's still in our statement of faiths. And when I say our, I'm being very general and very broad. So I'm not saying me, but I, I, I'm saying it's in our statement of faiths, uh, uh, original sin, but we've written it out. Well, how have we written it out? Be, because this, uh, original sin, let me explain what it is for those of you who don't know. Original sin is the biblical concept. I'm gonna show you some verses in a little bit. It's a biblical concept that since Adam and Eve a bit off of the fruit and disobeyed God, they, they passed, they allowed sin and death to enter the human race. And since that moment, because we are ancestors or descendants of Adam and Eve, that we have all been infected or affected by this original sin. And so every single one of us who's born are born into a world of sin. Not only are we born into a world of sin, but we are born in sin. Like, like we are born with a propensity to sin. Now, where is culture changing? Culture is changing here. Be, because we want to think humans are inherently good. We want to think that the human race is good, and so we want to pull the good out of people. And people become bad when they do bad things. Now, I like the way that sounds. The only problem is it's not in the Bible. And what I'm going to show you in the Bible is, is that it says that we are, we are born into sin. And we are born with this propensity, and, and, and we, are, we are born into it. And, and something needs to happen in our lives in order to take us out. And we've got to understand that all aspects of human nature, your mind and your spirit, your soul and your body, your reason, affections, emotions, and will, they've all been affected by sin. You see, the, the, the Bible uses this word sin, and they use this other word sinner. And, and we've kind of written these out of our language too, but I'm going to use them today because the Bible uses them. And, and we haven't translated a good verse or phrase for it yet, so I'm going to keep using it. But, 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 but now, now listen to this. Like, uh, people sin. When people sin, it doesn't make them a sinner. People sin because they are a sinner, all right? That, that is what the Bible actually teaches us. That, that isn't our sin that makes us bad. We sin because we are born into a world of sin. Another way to say this is that we were born into brokenness and that we've been broken and therefore as we age and mature that we begin to break other things. Now, now some of us struggle with this language right now because we're thinking about infants and we're thinking about, you know, children are they are they bad and how can they be broken and and part of our failure has been this is that we see sin purely as an individual personal uh, offense against God. So we only see sin as stealing or lying or cheating or being unfaithful or looking at that or, or cursing or swearing. Like it's some kind of very personal, which it is, but, but, but we see it only as that. What we understand in the Bible is that, that sin is actually bigger than that. This is why in Revelation, it says that God is gonna make a new heavens and a new what? Why would God make a new earth? Because it's broken by sin. And the only way to restore it is to remake it. And so we live in a world, not only of broken people, but a broken world. Now, when natural disasters happen, there's always a few lunatics that say, this is God's punishment upon, upon mankind. But, but, but if you understand the world is broken, you understand that even weather patterns are broken. I mean, the earth is fractured. It, it, it is broken, but God, God wants to heal it and God wants to restore it. And we are, we are born into this, this brokenness. And so when a child gets sick, listen very closely. It's not because of personal sin. It's because of, the pervasiveness of sin. Now, I want to be very clear because I don't want to get 10 emails from people. <laughs> Aaron, did you say sin makes us sick? No, I'm not saying that. 
I'm saying that cancer is a result of the pervasiveness of sin in the world. Are you with me? It is not supposed to be there by God's design. Sickness and death is not there. It has been entered into the human race through Adam and Eve, and we've been born into it, and we live in it ever since. You know, it's, it's interesting, and I love to say this because I still don't know if people believe me, but if you took sin out of the Bible, you would have four chapters of Scripture. You'd have Revelation 21 and 22 and Genesis 1 and 2. You wouldn't have the law. You wouldn't have the death of Jesus. I mean, like you, you wouldn't have it. And so most of Scripture is dealing with this brokenness. Are you still with me? So what is wrong with this thinking that, that, that everyone's good? It, it's this. Here's where, here's where we can go wrong. Is that we don't want to think anything is wrong with us as humans. We want to think that the problems that I face are not my problems, but the problems in the world. They're external. They're not internal. And, and this is what happens, and, and we're seeing this in our culture. And we're seeing this if we, as followers of Jesus, don't hold up the scriptures and what it says. Is that we, we see people living out uh, their brokenness in dysfunction as part of their identity. And what happens is life gets messier, not cleaner. We live out of a false identity when we do that, when we embrace our sinfulness and dysfunction as part of something of God's design. And we live not from a place of wholeness, but we live from a place of half-heartedness. Let me give you some scriptures. Uh, confirm this. In Rome, Romans 3, 3, 9, it says this. It says, well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than all the others? This is a Jew writing to Romans. He says, he says no, not, not at all, for we have already shown that some people, wait, hold on, did I read that right? I'm 40, maybe I need to get some glasses. What does it say, church family? Come on. All people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. All, all people. Romans 3.23. For have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't say some. It says all. All. And then it, and then it, gets, it gets worse, all right? It says this. Listen. Romans 8.7. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'm glad you came to Red Hills Church this morning. God loves you. All right. What, what, is, what is Paul saying? In fact, I would love to preach through the book of Romans. It might take me four years, but it would be a commitment from you and me. But but, but listen, I, I think what Paul is doing in the first part of Romans, he's making a case for how bad humans are. He does not say humanity is good. We were before the fall, but he's not saying you're, you're good at the core and your nature is good. He says this in Romans 3, and these verses just don't get preached on. He says, no one is righteous, not even one. Nobody, all of us. Been bro bro born in brokenness. And because we've been born in brokenness, we don't have to be taught to sin. Right? You know, no one has to teach you. Like, like it, it, it's almost as if that comes out more natural than the reverse. Are you with me? Right? You just, just think of you as a child or if you've raised kids. Like you don't, you don't have to teach kids that. But the sinful nature is hostile to God. Now, now, this is where I talk about the peace as status, because the peace that, that, that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 5, 1, has to do with your identity and has to do with your status in the kingdom of God and as a follower of Jesus. In, in fact, what we're going to read in a minute is, is, that, is that Paul goes a step further and he says that, he says that we're enemies of God. If, if, he says this. That we are either 
for God or we're against him. We are either in his grace or we are out of his grace. But it gets better, by the way. I know I just took you down, 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 down. It gets better. Here, here it goes. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? See, Paul, Paul, Paul's whole point is he's saying that we're born into sin, that we're hostile to God, that we're enemies to God. And the only way to be on the right side and be a friend of God is to put your life in, 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 a, in his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. Now, this is, this is profound. This is the peace that is with God. I want to read out of Colossians chapter 1, 19 through 22. I want to give you a few more verses. Chapter 1, verse 19 through 22, it says this, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether all things on earth or things in heaven, by making, help me out, peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus made peace, this kind of peace that the angels were singing, this peace as the status, this peace. He says this, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. I wanted to find two terms in the Bible that Paul uses for us today. The first one is the word alienation. It says what we are alienated from God. Alienation is this, it is being outside the sphere of God's blessing. He says that before Christ, that we are enemies of God in our mind, that, that, that we are against him. And we, we've been alienated, but it says that we've been reconciled to him. How have we been reconciled to God? I want to tell you one of the most profound theological parts of our faith that doesn't get enough airtime it is this, and uh, let's put up Romans 5.1 again. It says, therefore, since we've been justified, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God comes when we are justified through faith. What is justification? Let me, exp let me define it for you, then I'll explain it. Justification is the act in which God forgives a person of all their sins and declares them righteous in his sight. It's as the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, that is how far God has removed our transgressions from us. That is justification. Martin Luther said this. He said he preached justification every single week because people forgot it every single week. We forget what justification actually is. So let me go a little deeper into what justification is. Ju justification in the Bible is a legal term. Uh, it, it is a term that, is, that was used in secular culture in the first century uh, in the court of law. So it is a legal term, and it, and it literally means to be acquitted. To, it, it, the picture is a judge slamming a gavel down and saying, you're not guilty. Now. I've never been in a court accused of anything. <laughs> I've been pulled over by a cop before on Saturday night on the way home from planning my sermon. And he took my license and uh, he went back and he came back and he goes, I'm not going to give you a ticket. I said, that's good because I just bought your whole entire police force coffee, all right? <laughs> <laughs> A funny if Fred Meyer saw the chief of police. I said, I got pulled over. I'm looking for the cop who pulled me over. Well, there's nothing better than him to say, I'm not going to give you, you're not guilty. You just fix your taillight. Right? It, it's kind of like, it doesn't matter if I did anything wrong. Those lights flash and I'm, man, my, my blood pressure just goes up. Right? You can feel it. And it's that feeling of saying, you're free. 
How much more, when, when, when God says we're justified, he's saying, you've done a lot of bad things in your life. Not only have you done bad things, you've been a bad person because you've been born into sin. But when you put your faith in Jesus, you've been justified. One way that one of my teachers used to remind me of what this means is just as if I've never sinned, justified. No faith has this, by the way. No faith has this kind of grace that says that when you come to know Jesus, everything has been wiped clean. And you've been justified. It's interesting because the same word justification in the Bible is the same word as righteousness. It's interesting, and it gets changed. But I want to talk about two dimensions of righteousness for a moment that I think tie into our faith. The first one is this. It is called imputed righteousness, and the second one is imparted righteousness. Imputed righteousness is this. I, I like to explain it this way. You have a rich uncle. He's a millionaire, and you're his sole heir. And so when he passes away and goes to heaven, you're going to be a millionaire. All right? And so your uncle passes away, and your name is in the will. It's there. They, they are the sole heir of my entire estate. At this moment, you are declared a millionaire. But when you go to Chase Bank and you check your account, you have $99 in there. You've been declared, but you're not yet living it. It's on paper. It's there. You are a, mil a millionaire. Y you're it. But it's just not in your bank account. That, that's imputed righteousness. We believe also in imparted righteousness that not only have we been declared, but we receive it. And we receive it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God says, you've been declared righteous, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to allow you to live like the righteous person that I declared you to be. And it is another level, church family, to have a Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit impart the righteousness of God to you. And th this is what it means. It means that when God looks at us, he doesn't see you, but he sees you clothed in the righteousness of Jesus in the, the perfectness of Jesus. He sees you clothed with the perfection of Christ, his son, when you put your life in him. That is justification. Let's not forget what justification actually is. So let, let me end our time with this. I, I want to give four promises when we choose peace. Four promises when we choose peace with God. The first one is this. When I choose peace with God, I am completely forgiven. Isaiah 1.18 says this. Come now, let us settle the matter. I, I, I like how God speaks in Isaiah. Let's settle it, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Even in Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, people knew that we were born into sin and due a brokenness. And that we are stained because of it. But when we put our lives in Jesus, we are made new and we are made clean. It, imagine that everything that you've done wrong is put up on a whiteboard. And, and maybe some of you in your mind, like there's, there is a list of the things that you've done wrong. And, and they're all up there. And some of them are private and no one knows about. Some of them are public and everybody knows about, but they're written up there. It's as if God is, takes some Windex and some paper towels and he sprays it on this board and he just begins to wipe it clean. And you start with this purity that the Bible calls white as snow. Why do, imagine in Israel it's snowing, and it snows in Israel, it snows in Jerusalem. But it's rare when it snows, but they know what snow looks like. I mean, it's pure. He says, just like that, 
your life is when you come to know Jesus. But, but this, is, this is what I know what happens. The, the problem we face is, is not that God brings our sins back up in front of us, it's that we do. Even though we've been justified, this is why we need to remember it. How do I know this? Because God does it, or not God, the enemy does it to me. You, you go into a prayer meeting and the enemy reminds you of the things that you've done wrong. You walk into worship and he reminds you of the things you've done wrong. And all of a sudden you don't want to lift your hands because you don't feel worthy, even though you've already been justified. How do I know this? Because I walk on stage every Sunday. And the things that I've done sometimes go through my mind and I think, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not qualified. And it's the enemy bringing things up. And I forget that I've been justified. That I've been justified. That I've been, that that, that the slate has been wiped clean. That I've been made new and I've been renewed. And when you walk in this forgiveness, you begin to walk in freedom. This is also what I've discovered of doing ministry for 16 years, is that, is, is, that, is, that, is that even after being justified, sometimes we still sin, right? But, but this is what I've noticed, is that when we try to fix our sin ourselves, it gets worse. Because your head is down and you're saying, if only I did this better and if only I did this. And then, and then God says in his word in Hebrews, says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And he, it's, it's like a father going to a child and says, just look up at me. Yeah. When I want to get my kids' attention, I, I put my hand on their chin. I said, just look at me. And they're like, yeah. This is my youngest. He's just a ball of joy, but. Just look at, look at me, because I want to speak to you right now. Just, just look at me. And when we begin to look at God, when we begin to focus on him, we, be, we walk in another level of freedom. Here is the second thing, a promise I receive when I choose peace with God. When I choose peace with God, I have an assurance of my salvation. Many people come to know Jesus, but they get discouraged a year later, because they make a mistake. They somehow hurt someone, and, they, and then they ask, am I still safe? Like, does God still love me? I thought I was different. I thought I was a new creation. And, it, and if you, you grew up in, in church, and, and maybe you grew up in a certain stream of church where, where when, the, when, the, when the preacher came, he preached heaven sweet and hell hot, and he said, you get up front if you don't want to experience hot, and you got saved about 50 times in your life. Anybody else? The church I grew up in, they did this play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. It was scary as hell, all right? I was in the play and I got saved. Right? It's, it's because, it's, it's because we, we forget about this justification that we've been justified by faith. And somehow we think it, when we make mistakes, we've got to start over. I, I remember... Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I, I baptized this, uh, this young, young lady. She was a senior in high school, and she comes up out of the water, and she gives me a hug, and she goes, man, I'm so glad I, this is the fourth time I've been baptized. And then it occurred to me, I said, I, okay, I, I did baptize you in sixth grade, and <laughs> in eighth grade, and ninth grade, and now in twelfth grade. Like, you were covered. And, and the, the thinking is this, is that I, I must get baptized again because I need to be washed clean again. God's grace isn't that fickle that you have it one moment and you lose it the next. And I remember people, I don't want to go too into the weeds, but I remember people teaching me, it's like, man, if you're sinning and you happen to die while you're sinning, you're not going to go to heaven. That's some of the teaching I received. But then I read the Bible, oh man, God's grace is way, way deeper than that. He says, he says it is high and it is wide and it is deep. You can't find the bottom of it. That there is, oh, there's a dimension of God's grace that's got me even in my worst moments. Even my worst moments. Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, even I, 
if he who blots out your transgressions for your own sake and remembers your sin no more. If God doesn't remember your sin, why do you? The third one is this, when I choose peace with God, I can have peace with others. Ephesians 2.14. If you read through the Bible, you notice there's this big deal about Jews and Gentiles. And if you're new to the Bible, you'll know that Christianity started as a Jewish sect and then turned into this world faith that was open to all people. Uh, and so they're wrestling with this idea that, that, that the grace of Jesus is for people who aren't Jews. And Paul, who is a Jew, says this. He says, for he himself is our peace. He's our peace. And this is what peace does. Who has made us, the two groups, one. And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And it means that when we have peace with God, we can have, we can have that peace with others. We can be reconciled to one another. You know, for, for some of you, Christmas time and gatherings might not be the sweet event that you see on TV and the commercials and you think every other family has. It might be a, a, a scene of you seeing people that you don't really like and they, they don't really like you, that have hurt you and you just kind of dread it and you just ignore it. But the Bible says when we have peace with God, we can have peace with others. And it does take some work and it does take some conversations, but the Bible says that we can have it. We can have it. And here's the last one that I want to end with, is when I choose peace with God, I receive the peace of God. See, the peace of God is what everybody wants. But it is impossible to have the peace of God if you don't have peace with God. You can't get the inner tranquility, the calmness of your heart, and of your soul and of your mind in seasons of chaos, when you're sick or when you're hurt or when someone's dying, you can't have that without having peace with God. See, everybody wants the peace of God, but it takes having peace with God, understanding that I am broken and the way to wholeness is through Jesus Christ. The way to being set free is through Jesus Christ. When I choose peace with God, I receive the peace of God. Would you bow your heads as I close in prayer? God, I invite you into this place right now. God, I, I invite your spirit into our hearts. God, would there be a settling of your presence on this room right now? Would you begin to rest in our minds and our hearts? Friends, I would just ask you right now in this moment, would you focus your eyes on Jesus? Just turn your attention to him. God, would you release a new level of comfort and peace in this place? God, would you begin to pour out your spirit that you promised long ago in this place. God, would we pursue you as the only one that can reconcile us and the only one that can give us true peace. This is what I wanna do, church family, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I sense that maybe there are some in this room that you're not experiencing the peace with God. And it's manifests itself in all other places, in your work and in your family, in your school, whatever. But, but maybe it's because you, you don't have peace with God right now. You don't have the very thing that Jesus came to die for, that justification, that peace with God. And I, what I want to do is I want to lead you in a prayer. And I'm, I'm going to ask everyone in the room to repeat this prayer after me and if you're here today and you say you know what I want that peace with God I want you to mean this prayer in your heart this prayer is between you and God and this is an opportunity to put your life and your faith and your heart and your trust in Jesus Christ 
Everyone in the room, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my mistakes. I believe he rose from the grave. Forgive me of my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. Give me your spirit. Give me your peace. Give me your joy. Give me your love. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed? With no one looking around, and I just wanna ask you one more question. If you're here today and you said, you know what, that prayer meant something in, in my life, in my heart, and I feel like I am reconnecting with God. And if that's you, with no one looking around, I don't wanna embarrass you, I just wanna agree with you. If that's you, wherever you're at, would you just lift your hand up right now in this moment? All right, I see your hands right there. I see your hand in the middle. I see your hand in the back. I see your hand to my right. I see your hand all the way in the back. I see your hand right up here. I see your hand to my right. I see your hand in the middle. I see your hands up here. You can put your hands down. Here's the good news, friends. When you make that confession, God says, you've been justified just as if I never sinned. And he wipes everything clean. And you get to walk out of here with the newness of life as a new creation with the guilt off of your shoulders and the burden gone. It is the promise that Jesus came to give us. And so, Holy Spirit, would you fall upon everyone who just made that confession and commitment to you? Would you release your peace upon them? Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We give you praise for everything you've done in your name. And everyone together said, amen. God bless you, church. I'll see you next week. Don't forget. Yeah, let's just give God praise this morning. Come on. Thank you, God. I'll see you next week. Don't forget our Christmas Eve gatherings. Hold on a second as Pastor Andy comes out.